and we are all uniquely curious. I love to ask questions, and I've noticed that if I ask you what you like, you'll tell me something general, like, oh, I like to go for a walk. But if I change my question and ask you what you're most curious about, then the conversation begins to thrive. We begin to glow. And as I hear the details of your unique curiosity, let me show you what I mean. This is Eman and Rico. And if you take a look at them, you might say, well, they're roller skating. If you begin to look into the details, you'll see that they are roller derby queens, curious and mastering bank turns, nailing tomahawk stops, and leveraging slingshots. Mark, generally, you'd say he's growing flowers. If you look at the details, you will see that he is a wizard, genetically crossing and germinating orchids that he will wait five years to see bloom. He speaks a rare language called Orchidasia that allows him to travel the world finding and trading rare albino Orchids. He creates, he created his own biosphere where he works every day. It drips with saturated color. This is Nate. He skateboards. But the journey begins on a miniature skateboard that fits into his pocket. He uses the skateboard with his fingers, and he has taught himself how to translate that movement into his entire body. He learned parts of this move on a mini board on the back of his mother's bumper on the car. This is Augusta, Augusta Pace. But if you really pay attention, you'll see that Augusta has let go of time, space, color, and she's floating the realm of avant-garde, where she can change space using only white. Now, as I begin to pay attention to the things that people like, the things that people are most curious about, I decided that I wanted to look into the science of curiosity. I was a little nervous about it at first. I think I was afraid that something would debunk this magic that I knew that I was feeling in the conversations. But that's not what happened. In fact, I now believe that it is the curious details it gives us our best chance to adapt, to thrive, and maybe even to evolve. So the first thing that I wanted to do was make sure that I just kept going back and forth between the research that I was reading and finding real examples in my life and in my community. And I needed a mascot. <laughs> and he just kind of helped me keep it real um, and keep it playful. So. Um, let's see, the first thing that I discovered is that neurologists um, consider curiosity a distinct drive, very, very different than other drives. It's regenerative, and other drives are not regenerative. Think about this. When we get thirsty, we take a drink of water, um, and then we become quenched and satisfied. But that's not how curiosity works. When we take a drink of that, we just keep getting more curious. The other thing that it is, it's self-regulating. That means that we do it because we like it. We keep doing it because we love it. And nobody tells us how to do it. So I began to look around. Where is this happening in my life? Where is it happening around me? And I found it right away. This is my son, Nuri. And he decided to begin a podcast reviewing high-tech gadgets. He went around the house looking for all the high-tech gadgets that we have, reviewed them, and then when he got when there were no more left, he started to contact high-tech companies, asking them to send him free products for the show. He sent out hundreds of emails. He spent hours on the telephone, but he wasn't getting any takers. And so Murray did something pretty clever. He adapted his question to, why not? And he started getting responses almost immediately. They said they weren't really taking him seriously because there were spelling errors in the email. They asked him to send a demo tape of his work, and then they also wanted to have know which company he was a part of. Nuri adapted to each one of these requests, and within a year, he was getting the first free product in the mail, and then another. So the question is, is Nuri satisfied? Is he quenched? Or is he more curious? 
definitely more curious. He continues to refine his podcasting techniques. He still asks for ticket products for mail. Nobody told him to do this, and nobody's telling him to do it now. So these two properties, regeneration and self-regulation, are called something different by cognitive scientists. It's called looping. And uh, I keep this, this image helps me remind me of this idea. Now if you remember, in the movie, Yoda and Luke are having this ongoing battle where Yoda is always sharing his past experiences with Luke, and Luke is always sharing his vision for the future. But both of them are always talking about mastery. And this is what your brain does when it's curious, and it begins to loop. Now, between loops, this, there's this detailed conversation going on, and it's there to detect inconsistencies. And when it finds them, it sorts, discriminates, and then formulates a very precise and highly informed best, next best group. This is called state of optimal brain functioning. And what that means is that Yoda and Luke are not chit-chatting. They are having a detailed conversation and always keeping their eye on mastery. Which, strangely enough, brings me to this old proverb, curiosity killed the cat. This effectively wipes out that conversation as if it didn't exist. But scientifically, we know that that's not true. Curiosity is always moving towards mastery. So, let me show you how this works. Um, oh, it's moving towards mastery that's always keeping us safe. That's important. So let me show you how this works. This is Heidi. And she has already been looping to figure out where she should stand behind the lathe. She's been looping to figure out how fast she should spin the wood and where to put her chisel. Now, each time she's looped, she's had to moderate risk as she went along. If she didn't, then we would be looking at a dead woodworker instead of a master woodworker, right? So it is her curiosity and it's because she has fully activated her curiosity that keeps Heidi safe, not the other way around. So I was able to experience this really close up and personal. Uh, this is my daughter, Rebecca, at the age of 10, which she is now. But at the age of 4, she scrambled up a 40-foot tree. And at the time, she was on the top of the world. And I was at the bottom of the tree, scared out of my mind. It took me a while to coax her down, and when I did, it became my job to respond to her. What to do? I found the answer in not discouraging Rekha from her curiosity, but to encourage her curiosity. If I truly wanted her to be safe, I needed to be fully activated and engaged and paying attention. And that's what we did. We enrolled her into rock climbing classes the following week. She fell but not too far. She got scrapes and bruises, but not too badly. The important thing was that she was looping, using both success and failure as a way to begin mastering rock climbing and climbing in general. She became safer and smarter through her yoga superpowers of curiosity. So there it was. Um, oh, so let's think about that for a minute. I'm gonna let you read that quote. So, we're all born with curiosity, but it is our choice whether or not we fully activate and lean into that curiosity. So, um, I was going back and forth between uh, this research and real examples in my life. And um, I had this idea that began to occur to me. And I remember it very distinctly because it was a 2012 uh, election, and I was filling out the bubbles in my in my ballot. And at the same time that I was doing that, I was reading about personality psychologists and what they had discovered about curiosity. They discovered that people who are the most curious consider their work play. They enjoy their play more. They are less aggressive and less defensive towards others. On the other hand, those people who are less curious consider their work to be hard. They don't enjoy their play as much. They're more aggressive. They're more defensive. And they're more fearful. And as I'm dropping my ballot into the mailbox, it occurred to me in that moment 
that every vote on every item was directly influenced by my own curiosity about that subject. And it was a pretty powerful insight. So one of the other things that was occurring to me at this time, as I'm learning all these new words, regeneration, and self-regulation, and um, the safety mechanism attached to curiosity, and then applying this to my real life, I, this idea began to bubble up. And that was a question. Does curiosity have anything to do with evolution? So that's just sort of in the background of all this as I'm thinking about it. Now, as, as I'm filling out my biologism and doing this, I, I began to get on a roll. And um, I found another, curi another superpower of curiosity, and that was time traveling. My eldest daughter, Ivan, actually loves to write characters um, in her books that can do this. And when she does, she herself becomes timeless. If I call her name, she'll pop out of her timelessness to see if she's in any danger. And if she's not, she'll pop right back into timelessness and into her writing. If an MRI scan had been taken of her brain in that moment, it would have shown a shift in attention away from a basic drives like food, water, and sleep to an area in her neocortex where she has become a timeless traveler looping through infinite space. Now I'd like you to just stop and think about that for a minute. Her brain has just been something amazing. It has prioritized her unique curiosity as more important than these other basic tribes. Why? Is it evolutionary? We know that our brains want us to hang out in timelessness for as long as biologically possible. Because when we do, we get an ambrosia bath of neurotransmitters. When we get this bath, it feels like being alive. It feels like being deeply connected to our unique purpose. Neuroscientist calls the flow state. My all-time favorite description of it comes from a local uh, musician. He called it being in the almighty groove. <laughs> Love that. But the jewel of this journey had not yet happened yet. And um, it was called Evo Vivo. And I was hoping the first time I heard it that it was a dance move. Um, it's short for a science called evolutionary development. And right now, it's focused on the genetics of plants, flies, fish, and mice. It turns out that these little creatures are continually updating their genetic software through epigenes. We used to think that epigenes were evolutionary junk attached to our DNA, but they are not. Epigenes recombine our genes through little on and off switches. Now, I'm not talking about mutation, random mutation that happens over millions of years here. I'm talking about genetic change that happens within a lifetime. As these young, as these children, if these species grow up into adults, they are passing on an accumulation of epigene changes along with their genes to their children. So what switches an epigene on and off? Adaptive learning to the environment. Translation, figuring out what works best to live in the world today and how we think it will be in the future. So when do we, as uh, human beings, do our adaptive learning? Well, we do it the most, we do it the best, and we do it with an aim towards mastery through our curiosity. We share 99% of our physically genetic, physical genetics with a mouse. Do we continually update our genetic software as the mouse and apply do? If so, then by simply becoming more curious, we are genetically updating our DNA with the best, most adaptive evolutionary instructions for fighting. How cool is that? But let's bring all that down to us right here. What do we do with all this information, and how do we integrate it into our lives? I think we can begin by asking ourselves and one another, not what we like to do, but what we're the most curious about. And then, with intention, we 
lean into the details. What naturally will emerge will be ideas built for thriving. Out of all the ideas that you have, these will be the most adaptive and the most evolutionary. They will enrich your lives and the lives of this community. Thank you very much.